I think it was the most wonderful speech for anyone to come to Australia and talk about peace and peace throughout the world is a fantastic thing and his words were inspirational. It seems like after seeing His Holiness that there's been a, a, a special seed of, of peace uh, sown in Melbourne. We've been following truth for 18 years in another direction but it's truth the same everywhere and what we heard tonight was truth and I think the message was perfect. The love for all, hatred for none is a fantastic message um, and it, it's, some, it's something that, uh, that the entire community should embrace. I love your values and I wish that more Australians espouse those sort of values. And I can see why he um, is getting on with the heads of governments of other countries and I wish all um, Islam leaders were like that and we wouldn't have any trouble in the world. And when I heard the words of uh, his Holiness, I was really impressed with the uh, words of wisdom which he uh, gave us. And I think the world will be a better place if you all listen to uh, people like himself. It was an honour to meet a world leader who had such a positive message. And it was good to see that his community were engaging with the, the broader Melbourne uh, community as well. And fortunately, there's someone like him to say it to world leaders, to politicians, to get their attention. Because someone has to get their attention. And he lives it. It's inspiration. He said, uh, peace begins with you. Peace begins at home. If you have peace in you, it means that you are projecting peace. And if everyone of us had peace, it means that we will be projecting peace to each other. That was very uh, fundamental. That was very key to me. I, was, I can see why he's a, a leader of world peace, because he said exactly what I wanted to hear. And I certainly share a lot of his sentiments around our need to get to a place where we can understand the differences of people so that we can come together and find the similarities. So I was quite moved by his speech. When I was shaking hands, he was looking, we were looking into each other's eyes. Special. I've never seen people with so much smiles on their faces. Amadi, smile a lot. It's wonderful. Part of his tour of the Far East, Hazrat Khalifa al Masih V, may Allah be his helper, delivered a keynote address to a gathering of more than a hundred distinguished guests at a reception held in his honour in Melbourne on the 11th of October 2013. Before the event, a few officials had the honour of meeting Hazur, including Major General Paul McClackham, the senior ranking military officer in Victoria, the Honourable Anthony Byrne, and the Honourable Judith Grayley. The event was attended by more than 150 distinguished guests, which included interfaith leaders, professors, charities, community and military leaders, and government officials, including many members of the state and federal government, as well as members of the national parliament. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. Beloved Hazu, respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May peace and blessings be on you. Uh, we shall start formal proceedings of the program with the recitation of Holy Quran and its translation by Mansoor Durani. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everyone. A'udhu billahi min shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu kunu
ولا يجرمنكم شنان قوم على ألا تعدلوا اعدلوا وأقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون وعد الله The translation for the verse recited from Holy Quran, chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 follows. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity, and let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just, that is nearer to righteousness. And fear Allah, surely Allah is aware of what you do. Allah has promised those who, have be who believe and do good deeds that they shall have forgiveness and a great reward. Thank you. Now I would like to request Mr. Safdar Javed Chaudhary, the President of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association, Victoria. Please come forward to deliver the welcome speech. Assalamu alaikum. The Islamic greeting I've just sent to you, that means may peace be upon you all. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. With the name of Allah, the gracious and ever merciful. Beloved Hazur, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this special reception with His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, Supreme Head of Worldwide Ahmadiyya Muslim Community and the fifth successor and the fifth successor to the founder of Ahmadiyya Muslim Movement in Islam. At the outset, I record my respect and acknowledgement for the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today, and indeed for all Australia's indigenous people who enduring, whose enduring culture has nurtured this continent for tens of thousands of years. It is a matter of great pleasure that we have been graced by this auspicious occasion with the presence of you all. Please accept our sincere gratitude and appreciation for joining us at this historic occasion in the history of Victoria and Australia. It is a matter of pride for us that we have honorable members of parliament, members of six city, city councils, city mayors, representative of indigenous communities, leaders of various faith and community groups, government officials, members of police department and armed forces, foreign council journals, interfaith leaders, professors, authors, media representative, and most importantly, our wonderful neighbor in Langwaran. I welcome you all as each and every one of you is important and respectable to us. 
looking at the history of Ahmadiyya in Australia. Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Australia was formally established in the early part of 1980s and has its national centre in Sydney. However, the message of Ahmadiyya reached through the shores of Australia long earlier through Hazrat Hassan Musa Khan, who converted to Ahmadiyya in Islam in 1903. Following the traditions of other chapters of Australia, Ahmadiyya community in Victoria has been on front foot for promoting the message of peace, harmony, loyalty, and tolerance through the active participation on Victorian and national level. Victorian chapter of Ahmadiyya community has been actively participating and contributing in wider community activities like celebrating Australia Day regularly, interfaith dialogues, network and networking, Clean Up Australia Day, Red Cross Door Knock Appeal, Peace Symposium, blood donation drives, fundraising and volunteer work towards the brief relief of natural disasters, including bushfires, earthquakes, and floods. Dear audience, a unique feature of our community, which is also the driving force behind our worldwide efforts towards peace and harmony, is Khilafat, or spiritual successor successorship. His Holiness is a spiritual leader and guide to tens of millions of people around the world. And his directives are aimed at fostering absolute justice, human welfare, and social harmony. His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, is the worldwide leading Muslim figure promoting the peace and interreligious harmony. We are very fortunate and blessed by his visit and presence with us here in Australia nowadays. At the end, it is my humble prayer and supplication that may God, the Allah gracious, enable us all to work together for the peace, prosperity, and betterment of this world and humanity. At the end, once again, I thank you and welcome you all for your kind attention and participation in today's event. Thank you very much. Now I would like to request our guest speakers. Our first guest speaker is Sandra Meyer. She is the mayor of the city of Frankston. Sandra Meyer, please come forward. Thank you very much. His Holiness, Mirza Masru Ahmad, head of Worldwide Ahmadiyya Community in Islam. I welcome you to our beautiful country, Australia, and I hope that you enjoy your stay to the members of parliament, fellow councillors, and all the distinguished guests here today. What a great honour it is to be here. It's not every day that you get to meet a world leader. Five years ago, as a new councillor, I was introduced to our new neighbours in Langwarren, the Ahmadiyya community. And what a pleasure it was. We had a barbecue, our children played cricket, and the neighbours welcomed you into the Frankston community. Five years on, our relationship is still going strong, and here we are today, celebrating this very special day and continuing to spread your beautiful message, love for all and hatred for none. If only every person on earth lived their life this way, there would be no war, only peace. I thank you for inviting me here today, and I hope that you all have a very memorable evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, our next guest speaker is Judith Grayley. Judith is the state member of, for Narewaran South and has been community, community's friend for the last few years. Judith, please come forward. Thank you. His Holiness, welcome. Welcome to our part of the world. To my parliamentary colleagues, also welcome to our part of the world and to the many councillors from far away. Welcome to Mulgrave and to the southeast of Melbourne. It's a very great pleasure for me to be here representing the Leader of the Opposition as his Parliamentary Secretary. 
I know that he would want to extend a very precious welcome to all members of the Amadea community. They have become our friends. The women especially have become close friends of mine. And I was only just saying to His Holiness how through our concern about peace in the world, our concern with building bridges between religions, and I'm very pleased to see Pam Mamuni here as head of the Casey Multi-Faith Network, because I think it was Pam that introduced me to Noreen and Coca-Cola. And that message, that strong message that comes from your community, that comes from your religious beliefs of love for all and hatred for none, was something that resonated not only with my soul, but also with my head. And like the mayor, I only wish that more people could take that message with them and live by it and spread it. So I'm very pleased to welcome you on behalf of every member of the local community here tonight. Uh, congratulations to the organisers of this evening as well. It is just a magnificent to look out here and see everybody here. So thank you. Thank you, Judith. Now I would like to ask Mr. Anthony Byan, please come on stage to say a few words. Anthony Byan is the federal member for the Holt Electorate in the House of Representatives in the Australian Parliament. Uh, thank you very much. It is a great honour, sir, for you to be in this country and for us to welcome you on behalf, as I must uh, say, on behalf of the federal opposition. It must be very difficult in these very turbulent times to be a spiritual leader. I think you are the spiritual leader to 200 million people of your faith. There are turbulent times and it must be very difficult to be a leader of your followers when a number of them are being persecuted for their interpretation of your great faith. Uh, we are particularly impressed with the members of the community in our area and our region who reach out to us in a spirit of your faith and a spirit of your teaching and your preachings and preachings to reach out to extend their hand in faith to us so that we can come together to create a meaningful dialogue a dialogue that will result in deeper understanding and if i can use your holiness the example of your local community the work that they do in trying to reach out to us and the works that they do to benefit of the community in keeping with your teachings do great credit to you and to the people that follow your faith. As I said, we live in troubled times. Perhaps those that are debating what occurs in the US Congress, perhaps those that are debating what happened in world affairs could take heed of your great example. There really does need to be dialogue in this country, not just through religious faiths, but through political parties, through communities. I know there's Michaelis Michael from the La Trobe University, and I think it's the Centre for, for, for Dialogue and Interfaith Dialogue. It's quite critical. We know what separates us, but what we need to remind ourselves is what brings us together. And so, Your Holiness, it is a great honour, as I've said, on behalf of us all, for you to be here sharing your faith your presence with us tonight. I wish you well in your travels and your journeys, not just here, but for the rest of your life. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Our next guest speaker is Inga Palish. She is state member for Southeastern Metropolitan Region. Inga Palish, please come forward for a few words. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm honoured to be able to join such an auspicious occasion, uh, which, is, which has been convened to welcome uh, His, uh, His Holiness, uh, a leader in a, in a religion that uh, preaches peace, uh, something that, of course, we as Australians, uh, which is the home to such a large multicultural community, endorse. 
and it's as a result of uh, our willingness to and, and uh, need to associate ourselves with those religions, uh, those people who uh, share our view that, uh, that we need to respect diversity, we need to understand uh, each other's differences, we need to understand and respect each other's religious freedom, that we come together as a, as a mark of respect to welcome you, of course, to Australia. And I think it's delightful that we have uh, so many levels of, uh, of uh, our community represented here from the federal members of parliament. And so to be associated with, uh, of course, um, your um, uh, religion, uh, especially your emphasis on love for, love for all and, of course, hatred for none is something that is integral to the success of our society and success of humanity. So welcome to Australia. We're delighted to be able to be a part of this reception. And, of course, I'd like to extend the greetings of the Premier who also is unable to be here today. And on behalf of the state government, I'm delighted to be here in his stead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nga Pelish. Our last guest speaker is Major General Paul McLachlan. Major General is the Headland Systems, and today he is representing Lieutenant General David Morrison, Chief of Army. Major General, please come forward. Uh, Your Holiness, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen of the Ahmadiyya community and of the Victorian community as well. On behalf of the Chief of Army, Lieutenant General David Morrison, uh, I'd like to thank you for the honour of being invited to attend such a, a, an auspicious and important occasion. It may seem incongruous to some of you to be addressed by someone in the military as a precursor to a keynote address on tolerance and harmony. I'd like to take a little of your time to explain why this is not so. The Australian military stands as a last resort option for the Australian people against tyranny, oppression and extremism. We are committed by government to respond to the failure of governance or the onset of evil with the threat or the application of violence. Now, while we may be tasked with humanitarian assistance or we may be tasked with nation building, and while we strive to be disciplined and selfless, our actual capacity for and the potential to employ violence will always and should always define us as the last resort. The message and teachings portrayed by His Holiness and represented by the Ahmadi community should be our first resort and enduring practice. The promotion of peace, tolerance and love for all across our community is fundamental in the establishment of trust and understanding amongst all peoples. In teaching the community what is right and fair, good governance is supported and nourished and evil is marginalised. The Ahmadi philosophy develops these behaviours through leadership and by example, rather than by threat or coercion. We of the last resort crave the success of the first resort. The key themes espoused by His Holiness and many of his addresses, those of religious tolerance, loyalty to country, rejection of extremism, rebellion, disorder, commitment to community, and the pursuance of peace, they resonate with the key values of the Australian military and all true Australians. I honour the sacrifices and risks you take to bring these messages to the world and thank you for your gracious visit to our country. I very much look forward to your address. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum again. Ladies and gentlemen, the personality which we have gathered to, together today to hear to the person for the keynote address, and this is the time now. I'll request Hazrat Khalifatul Masih to come further. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. All the distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. Before moving on to speak about those critical matters that the world stands in urgent need of, I would like to first of all take this opportunity to thank all of you for accepting our invitation and joining us here today. The fact that you are attending irrespective of differences of religion and belief is a testament to your open-mindedness and tolerant nature. Certainly, keeping in mind today's materialistic world, the fact that you have you come to listen to the words of a religious person is proof of your enlightened minds and broad, uh, broad vision. Whilst from a worldly perspective, it is a necessary moral courtesy for me to express my appreciation to you. However, even more importantly for me, it is essential to show my gratitude because it is my religious obligation. It is necessary to offer thanks in order to express gratitude to my Creator because my Master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught that a person who is not grateful to man cannot be grateful to God Almighty. Human beings are the greatest of all of God's creation. And Allah, the Almighty, desires for mankind to respect and honor one another. This is why the Holy Quran, which is the sacred book for all Muslims, and according to our belief, the final law-bearing book is filled from cover to cover with commandments requiring mankind to fulfill the rights of one another. Certainty, certainly, to express due express, uh, appreciation to another person is also a means to fulfill the rights owed to man, and so my gratitude is not offered as a mere formality, but actually emanates directly from my heart. Thus, I hope it is clear that my heartfelt appreciation is expressed not only in order to uphold high moral courtesies, but in order to gain the pleasure of God Almighty. With these brief words of introduction, I would now like to discuss some issues of great concern, which are taking people far away from fulfilling the rights of each other in today's world. Certainly, the critical state of today's world is visible to all. The financial crisis that occurred a few years ago has completely shaken the world's economy to its very core, and the effects continue to be felt today. The cost of living and inflated prices have crippled the world and high unemployment is reaching record levels in certain countries. A number of European countries have become consumed by debt and even bankrupted. And this is not just a European problem. In fact, if you look at the United States,
which is considered most powerful country of the earth, on the earth, we find that some city consuls have been forced to declare their cities bankrupt as they have succumbed under the weight of mammoth debts worth billions of dollars. Even now, the federal government has reached to the point that some of their offices have reached to the point of shutdown. This is the state of the developed countries. Whilst the econo economies of underdeveloped nations have always been in trouble. Compared to much of the world, Australia is to some extent stable. However, it has also been affected by the world's financial crisis. In today's global age, the world has come together like never before. Thus, the problems faced by one country have a knock-on effect on other nations, while successes in one country have a positive effect on others. Bearing this in mind, it cannot be said that any country is free from problems or immune to the global debt crisis. Furthermore, we find that the world's financial crisis had not yet been resolved when another huge crisis took root in some countries. This crisis I'm referring to particularly affecting the Arab world and Muslim countries and came to be known as the Arab Spring. In various countries, members of the public began to stand up against their rulers and governments. Huge protests and marches took place. Massacres and killings occurred, leading to thousands of people being murdered. And still today, thousands are continuing to lose their lives. In some countries, the ruler, rulers were able to suppress the protests and control the situation. However, in others, the rulers faced very tough and even brutal consequences. Today, there are still some countries ravaged by war where the governments are continuing to face huge rebellions. The major powers have become involved in some of these conflicts by supplying weapons and money to the rebels in the name of assisting the people. However, we have to question the result of such efforts because disorder and chaos continue to plague these nations. If you look at Libya as a case in point, we find that its governing officials, political analysts, and media are all in agreement that uh, tribal governments have now formed and consequently the central government is facing grave difficulties and it's entirely weakened. During a recent visit to the United States, a journalist from a very famous newspaper asked me, what I thought would be the long-term effects or benefits of the action, action that took place in such countries. I responded by stating that such action would not lead to peace, either in Libya or in Egypt, 
and nor would it lead to peace in the other affected nations. Indeed, when I met her, the journalist, in May this year, I said that it was apparent that further bloodshed was impending in Egypt. However, I did not expect it to occur so soon, yet just weeks later, we all saw what transpired. Despite the violence and huge loss of life, it was quite apparent that on this occasion, the major powers ignored the severe force used by the new government against certain segments of the public. Perhaps it was felt that it was necessary for a, fir for a firm hand to be taken against such people. But the same end, uh, same end result could have been achieved with less force. However, the point I am making is that upon the onset of the same circumstances, in the name of establishing peace, the major powers took two entirely different approaches. Let us look at the example of another country. We all see that the situation in Syria continues to inflame and deteriorate before our eyes. Tens of thousands of people have died and are continuing to, whilst millions of Syrian citizens have been forced to flee their country to escape from the horrific situation. In the past few weeks, it seems that an alliances, alliance of a few foreign countries is preparing to launch a military attack on Syria. But fortunately, that situation has now been changed. It may well be the case that Syrian rulers have carried out barbaric cruelties, injustices against their own people. However, in seeking to achieve liberation, the rebel groups have themselves resorted to atrocities and cruelties. Innocent people who practice the same religion as the Syrian rulers or hold similar beliefs are being brutally murdered by these opposed to the government. Furthermore, on the pretext of helping the Syrian people, extremist groups from outside of Syria have come and joined the war. However, they are not fighting the government due to any human sympathies or compassion, but are seeking only to serve their own personal interests and gains. Syria's government has claimed that it has not used any chemical weapons, and rather it counterclaims that the rebel groups have used them. Outside agencies and inspectors have said they have evidence that chemical weapons have been used in Syria, but there does not seem to be any evidence to prove who has used them. <clears throat> but now these agencies are there in Syria to destroy those weapons. We just pray that Allah help them to do uh, to, to succeed in their action. God knows better what the truth is. The state of affair in Syria has not only destroyed the peace and harmony of the region, but is also destroying the peace of the entire world. 
An important principle is that if any country commits cruelties or transgresses, then first and foremost, it is the duty of the neighboring countries to step in and stop it. Some, uh, some months ago, a very wise suggestion was made by Israel's president in relation to solving the Syrian crisis. He said that while the world's major powers could provide Syria's Arab neighbors with weapons or support, any action taken to try to uh, try and establish peace should comprise only Arab forces. He said that if Western or non-Arab armies were to become directly involved, then the peace of the world would further deteriorate. Indeed, it is entirely accurate to suggest that an attack on Syria will be a means of provoking a third world war. Two major opposing blocs would form. In fact, they already have. We find that Russia and China and some of their allies are assisting and strongly supporting the Syrian government. As I said, there is a serious risk of a world war, and if we want to avoid it, then policymakers will have to make decisions with wisdom and with great consideration. What does Islam teach about establishing peace in such circumstances? Chapter 49, verse 10 of the Holy Quran says, And if two parties of believers fight against each other, make peace between them. Then, if after that one of them transgresses against the other, fight that party that transgresses until it returns to the to the uh, to the command of Allah. Then, if it returns, make peace between them with equity and act justly. Verily, Allah loves the just, uh, the just. And so, this is the method which should have been used by Syria's neighboring countries to bring about peace between the government and the opposition groups. Unfortunately, this approach was not adopted from the outset. And so thousands of people have been killed and hundreds of thousands have been left homeless. In reality, it was the task of the Organization of Islamic Conference to unite and work towards peace in the region. However, rather than is, assume their duties, the Muslim countries invited Western countries from outside the region to try and bring peace. Or perhaps the Western countries chose to invite themselves. What will the end result be? We are actually seeing the effects already beginning to appear, whereby two opposing blocs, each with differing sympathies, have formed. This division is causing us to reach the devastating precipice of a third world war. In the Quran, in the Quranic teaching that I presented, it clearly stated that all attempts to establish peace amongst conflicting parties should be underpinned by true justice. This should 
not be that those tasks with establishing peace task with establishing peace demand regime change as a necessary precondition. And that they then hand a particular group the key to the government. If the party that has transgressed agrees to fulfill the rights of its citizens and to treat them with fairness and equality, then those who have come as peacemakers should not set unjust or unwarranted conditions. They should not use more force than is proportionate or required because that will only lead to the situation spiraling further out of control. Islam teaches that when a third party seeks to bring about reconciliation between two warring um, factions, it should act impartially and with true justice. Certainly, the teachings I have presented are the true and beautiful teachings of Islam. If Muslims were to follow this guidance, we would not find a state of restlessness amongst the masses because unrest is only triggered when a person's due rights are seized or not fulfilled. Where decisions are made according to true principles of equity and where the rights of all people are fulfilled, only peace and harmony will be found. Regarding the fulfillment of the due rights of one another, there are many other profound teachings given by Islam. However, due to the shortage of time, it is not possible for me to cover them here today. Here I would like to point out that this golden principle given by the Quran is not only for Muslims, but in fact it is a universal truth that in order to establish peace, justice must prevail. Unfortunately, when in the name of bringing peace, major powers interfere in the matters of other countries, they do not uphold the requirements of justice to the necessary degree or in minute detail. During a visit to the United States, I also addressed their senior politicians and policy makers. I clearly said to them that any act or policy they undertake to try and develop peace would never prove successful. Um, develop peace, it will never be successful. Until all personal interests were set aside and until the requirements of justice were upheld in an entirely selfless manner. It is for this very reason that at another place, the Holy Quran has stated that you must always remain just, even if it means that you have to testify against yourself or your loved ones. And so the point I make is that it is the duty of major powers and the United Nations to strive to bring about peace and reconciliation through equity and fairness. Where there is a dispute between two parties or nations, all efforts should focus on drawing their attention to fulfilling each other's rights. Where a peace deal or agreement is reached, then neither the major power nor the United Nations should seek to further their own political objectives from any nation or group. If we cast a glance over history, we find that the League of Nations fundamentally failed in its objectives because it was not acting upon the aforementioned principles. 
Its chronic failure to establish justice led to unparalleled devastation when the Second World War occurred. Similarly, if we fast forward to, uh, to today, we find that the United Nations is not fulfilling its role as it ought to, and often remains silent on many issues. Further, the leaders of the major powers openly challenge its authority and state that they do not need the permission of the United Nations and that it is their right to act as they please. They say that if they wish to attack Syria, they are free to do. They should realize that they, that by completely discarding principles of justice on the pretext of fulfilling the rights of others and while sitting thousands of miles away will undoubtedly only lead to strife and disorder. Through such acts, all people will be affected. The world has come together like a global village. And so such disorder will not be contained, but will encompass and consume the entire world. This is the reason why I say time and time again that we should make every possible effort to save the world from a third world war. If such a war was to occur, then there would n not only be a threat of chemical weapons, but rather there is a very strong likelihood that nuclear weapons would also be used. The horrific effects of atomic warfare are indescribable and would be felt for generations to come. And so I would request all of the in influential figures in this country, be they politicians, dignitaries, or intellectuals, to recognize that because Australia is also one of the countries of the world, they too should play their respective roles in making every effort to transform the state of disorder and injustice into a state of peace and harmony. May it be that your future generations come to thank and pray for you rather than curse and abuse you for the legacy left behind. At the end, I would like to once again thank all of you for taking the time and effort to attend this function and to listen to what I have said. May Allah bless you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is our tradition and practice that we start every task seeking guidance from the Creator, the Lord, Allah Almighty. And we do finish with the prayer as well, seeking the guidance from the Lord, from Allah Almighty. The way we do our prayer is, it is a silent prayer. We raise our hand together, asking, asking and seeking the help and guidance from, from the God. And I'll request Hazur to lead the prayer, and whoever would like to join in, you're welcome. Hazur, I request you to please lead the prayer.
I loved it. I was. I can see why he's a, a leader of world peace because he said exactly what I wanted to hear, um, and um, he touched on the countries and the problems of the world. And I can see why he um, is getting on with the heads of governments of other countries. And I wish all. Um, Islam leaders were like that and we wouldn't have any trouble in the world. Uh, it was an absolute honour for me uh, to meet His Holiness. Uh, uh, truly the, uh, the values that, uh, that the Ahmadi uh, culture actually preaches are, are very, very close to our own. Uh, the, uh, the love for all, hatred for none is a fantastic message um, and it, it's, some, it's something that, uh, that the entire community should embrace. Look, I found it compelling listening. The message was very strong and I think the message that he had to deliver us was a special one and it's one that we should all take on board in everything we do, irrespective of your religion. It doesn't matter what you believe, but I think there is the universal message about uh, peace, uh, non-violence, justice and service uh, was something that we should all take with us tonight and try and live by. I found His Holiness and his message and his speech to be one of uh, obviously of peace. He's obviously a man who's given and who's very committed to peace amongst uh, the world and uh, I found him uh, extremely illuminating and informative. Uh, I thought it was one of peace and harmony and that's what we should be speaking to each and every one of, you, of us and to have that content and delivery it really demonstrates the goodwill amongst everyone here tonight. Oh, I thought it was inspirational actually. Um, a lot of um, discussion about the UN and perhaps uh, where they need to step up a little bit more so that was really interesting hearing his perspective of that but um, all the speakers I thought you know, had a lot to say and a lot to offer the evening. I think it's a message of peace. Uh, it's really good to see a uh, religious leader talking about uh, very uh, universal values of peace. Uh, above all religions, peace and harmony comes first, and that's the message I got in. And I think many communities will learn from this sort of events that how diverse and multi-faith we are in Victoria, in Australia. That's a very strong message. Well, I thought his speech was very challenging, and I thought it was very important for us to be confronted with issues of the lack of justice in our world and the real importance of getting all people together to work together. There's not some people good, some people bad. We must always work together. I thought that was the message that I took out of what he was saying. It seems like after seeing His Holiness that there's been a, a, a special seed of, of peace uh, sown in Melbourne. What His Holiness spoke about as far as Syria is concerned uh, is of world importance and fortunately there's someone like him to say it to world leaders, to politicians, to get their attention because someone has to get their attention and he lives it. It's inspiration. I actually had uh, an opportunity to go up to him and uh, have a, a little chat with him. I asked a specific question about uh, interface and peace building and what he told me was very inspiring. Uh, do you want to know what he told me? He said, uh, peace begins with you. Peace begins at home. If you have peace in you, it means that you are projecting peace. And if everyone of us had peace, it means that we'll be projecting peace to each other. That was very uh, fundamental. That was very key to me. Magana.